Okay, and we are now live. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this important discussion on Erie's water quality. My name is Raven Clark. I'm the Satellite Program Coordinator at the Jefferson Educational Society. So before we get started, I want to encourage you to take a look at our website. That is www.jeserie.org to see all of our programs that we host at the Jefferson on State Street, that's our main location in Erie, the Cory Higher Education Council in Cory, the Lincoln Community Center Library in Fairview, Penn West University in Edinburgh, the Erie Center for Arts and Technology in Erie, the Harbor Creek Township build Building in Harbor Creek, and of course, digital programs on JES Facebook Live and Zoom Livestream webinar. The JES also publishes regu regular essays and reports, and we have a Civic Leadership Academy pro for professionals aged 25 to 45 who are interested in making a positive impact in the Erie community. So like I said, I encourage you after this program to take a look at our website just to see all of the things that we do. So the JES has partnered with Penn Future and the Asbury Woods Partnership to provide educational programming around the topic of our most precious resource, water. This afternoon, we will hear from local professionals who work closely with preserving our water. Moderating this panel will be Jenny Tompkins of Penn Future and Sarah Bennett of Asbury Woods. Jenny Tompkins, PA, BA, is F Penn Future's campaign manager for clean water advocacy. She leads the Our Water, Our Future campaign focused on implementing sound policy solutions to improve water quality and ensure the health of communities in the Pennsylvania Lake Erie watershed. She earned her BA in environmental studies at Allegheny College. Prior to joining Penn Future, she served as a professional grant writer and community trauma reduction advocate. Most recently, she held the position of Crawford County Assistant Planning Director for Community Development. Fortunate enough to grow up on the Finger Lakes in central New York, Jenny developed an appreciation for freshwater ecosystems at an early age. Sarah Bennett, MS, is the Director of Education and Community Programs at Asbury Woods Partnership. Asbury Woods engages with over 20,000 people each year through educational programs and events. Prior to her work at Asbury Woods, Sarah was a campaign manager for Clean Water at Penn Future and at different times was sustainability coordinator, department chair and senior lecturer of biology at Mercierist University. She is a lifelong resident of the Great Lakes region, earning her BS and MS in zoology at Michigan State University before moving to Erie. So now I'm going to give it away to Sarah and Jenny to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Raven. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I just real quickly wanted to mention just a little bit more about Asbury Woods and what we're doing here, and then we're gonna have our panelists introduce themselves. I'll pass it to Jenny and then we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. So I am the Director of Education and Community Programs at Asbury Woods. This Asbury Woods is a nature center and trail system with over 260 acres of land with several ecosystems and a portion of Walnut Creek that runs through our land. And this year we have deemed our, it our year of water and that is a programmatic theme. And so what we're doing is presenting a number of programs related to water and including this panel discussion. And our goal is to get the public to understand the importance of water resources in our lives. So Jenny, I'll let you introduce yourself just a little bit more and then we'll pass it to our panelists. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks to our panelists and thanks to the JES for hosting us this afternoon. As Raven mentioned, my name is Jenny Tompkins and I am the Erie-based campaign manager for clean water advocacy with Penn Future. We are a statewide environmental advocacy non-profit, excuse me, with five offices in Erie, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, East Stroudsburg, and Philly. And I'm, I feel very fortunate to be able to co-moderate today with Sarah Bennett, my predecessor, who actually laid the foundation for the campaign work that I'm doing in Erie. And that campaign, the Our Water, Our Future campaign, recognizes that our regional freshwater resources are at the center of our Erie identity. And water very much defines us, but also our actions as humans have tremendous impacts on the health and functionality of our waterways and the communities that call them home. So we focus on eight key threats to water quality and human health in the Lake Erie watershed and a number of different policy and community-based solutions to address those challenges. And I have the benefit of working closely with each of the panelists that we have here today, Jim, Sarah, and Amber. So I'm gonna give them each an opportunity to introduce themselves. So starting with Jim and then moving to Sarah and Amber, would you please introduce yourself, describe your role and tell us briefly about your organization. 
Sure, my name is Jim Head. I'm the president of our local chapter of Trout Unlimited. Uh, of course, we, we fall under the state umbrella as well as the national umbrella of Trout Unlimited. And basically, um, to make, put it, I guess, in one sentence, the mission of Trout Unlimited as a whole is to protect, protecting, reconnecting, and restoring and sustaining our cold water resources. So that involves a bunch of resources, but it's all very uh, on topic for what we're going to discuss today. I am uh, Sarah Peelman. I'm the co-chair of the Pennsylvania Lake Erie Watershed Association, along with um, Sister Pat Lupa, Lupo. <laughs> and um, FLU was established back in 2000. It's our longest standing watershed association in the Lake Erie watershed. So we're 23 years old and um, FLU is dedicated to working towards the protection, restoration, enhancement, and sustainable development of the Lake Erie watershed within Pennsylvania. Thanks for having me today. Hey everybody, thanks for having me. My name is Amber Stowell and I am the Master Watershed Steward Coordinator for Penn State Extension in Erie, Warren, and Crawford Counties. I also work for Pennsylvania Sea Grant as a Coastal Outreach Specialist, but I'm here today to talk mostly about our watershed program. Uh, the Master Watershed Steward Program is a community-based volunteer program that is dedicated to conserving watersheds and preserving water quality for future generations. We do have programs across the state in 41 counties, and I just happen to coordinate the program that's local to this very fabulous region. That's great. Thanks, everyone. I, I always like to start off with a little bit of a, an icebreaker. This one doesn't feel quite like that, but, but I'm excited to hear everybody's answer. So what is your favorite body of water in Erie County and why? I guess I can start with that. And the honest answer is it really depends on the season. But uh, I mean, when the steelhead are running, it's the tributaries. But if I had to pick one overall, it would probably be Presque Isle Bay in the lagoon system. Uh, there's just so much diversity there. I mean, it's not just about fishing. There's, you know, so much plant life, uh, bird, you know, migration to watch and just so, so much to do there that, uh, and even in the winter, um, you know, snowshoeing or cross country skiing there is a good, you know, this year it wasn't very good for either one of those, but I'm sure we'll get snow again. So. There's, it's just a, it's a tremendous resource for our community, and that's why I guess I would have to pick that. <laughs> um, my favorite, well, obviously, because Lake Erie is one of the five great lakes of the entire world, I would have to say Lake Erie would be number one. But um, after that, um, I really like the Howard Eden Reservoir, even though it's a reservoir and it's man-made. Uh, we locally call it Bulls Dam. And that's where I first like went fishing when I was a little girl and caught, um, what are they, pumpkin? Some kind of pumpkin fish? <laughs> I can't remember the name of it now. But anyway, that was like the very first fish I caught. And we also used to catch um, catfish there with my dad. But a natural body of water, I would say, is Lake Pleasant. But because Lake Pleasant is really super cool because it has that calcareous bog there with special plants. And um, so I failed the first question because I couldn't pick just one. <laughs> I was able to pick just one, um, but it's also on Presque Isle. Uh, Leo's Landing is a personal favorite of mine. Um, it's, uh, if you go down to Presque Isle, you can go out onto the overlook platform called the feather and you can see how beautiful and expansive that just you know specific water body is um that's near and dear to my heart because i've watched it change over time it used to be infested with with a lot of invasive species like phragmites and i have been involved or watched the uh organizations do the work around removing those invasive species and creating a better habitat for a really diverse um amount of um, insects, reptiles, amphibians, and plants. Um, so it's really special to me and it's just absolutely beautiful any time of year. Thank you, Jenny. That was a good icebreaker. We heard about more than just three bodies of water too, which is great. And it's wonderful because we do have a lot of water resources in the area, so it's hard to pick just one. Um, okay, so for our, our more serious question to get us started with our discussion here, 
Um, can you each tell us what the importance of clean water is to your organization's mission? And I think for this one, we can start with Sarah Peelman. Um, I think it's important more to just Plua's mission. I think clean water is important to um, everyone who lives in the city of Erie and many other municipalities in northern Erie County, because that's where a lot of us get our drinking water from. And um, water makes up our very bodies. And so most living be beings on our planet need water to survive, whether we're humans or trees or plants and animals and insects. And so I think it's important to everyone in a lot of ways. And so Plua's goal is to help be a voice for clean water in our watershed. Amber, how about you next? And then Jim, we'll follow up with you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think when I was thinking about this question, clean water really is our mission. And I think that we can all relate to that. Um, our volunteers dedicate their time and energy to make the water around us healthier. They plant trees, they install riparian buffers, they do water testing, and they educate the communities around them about the importance of clean water. Uh, so honestly, we will always have work to do until all of our watersheds have pristine water quality. And for, for, my, for my point of view, uh, as I said in my opening statement, I mean, Trout Unlimited is all about protecting, connecting, uh, you know, all our cold water resources. And, and really, clean water is essential to a healthy habitat for fish, plants, and all of aquatic like, life, I'm sorry. And uh, it's also, uh, by the way, it's also very important for humans as well. So it, it all ties together and, you know, protecting water, as, as we try to do sometimes at the source and then, you know, through the entire watershed uh, is, is, is a very important part of that, I think. And it's, it's really a big part of what uh, Trout Unlimited does. There's a number of ways that we do this. Uh, Amber or referred to a few of those. Uh, it would be, we do water testing, we do uh, habitat improvement projects. And I guess that's maybe in a later question, so I won't get into too much to it, but uh, you know, we're, we're very much involved with that. That's great. Thank you all for speaking about your organizations and similar work, but different twists or different groups and target audiences for some of the work that you do. Next question is going to chat a little bit about the threats we have to water quality. And as I reference for the work that Penn Future is doing, we've identified eight threats to our water resources in the Lake Erie watershed. And we know, as Amber was saying, that we have a lot of work to do before we have swimmable, fishable, drinkable waterways and also waterways that support aquatic habitats. So I'm going to now ask, what are some of the threats to water quality that you are all seeing in your work? And we'll start with Amber for this one. Thanks, Jenny. Um, one of the biggest threats that I'm seeing is um, a lack of using best management practices when it comes to watershed management. Uh, so a specific example that I had in mind is um, a not well-maintained riparian buffers. Um, it's a very common practice in our community to mow up to the water's edge, um, but leaving a small or even wider buffer, maybe 50 to 200 feet of native plants, grasses, and trees makes a huge impact when it comes to preventing contaminated runoff from entering the water. Uh, and those native shrubs and trees do more than just prevent contaminants. They also shade the water and provide leaf litter to the organisms within the water. Uh, so um, that's one thing that I'm seeing is um, le uh, less than ideal management practices when it comes to uh, watershed management. That's a great example, Amber. Jim or Sarah, did you want to weigh in on what you're seeing? Sure, um, I'll go ahead and go. Um, another problem that we notice is um, pollution that can enter our waterways from uh, stormwater runoff, especially even the very soil itself. Soil belongs on the land, not in the water. And once soil is eroded off the land and carried into the water, it's pollution. Um, you basically, you can't drink dirty water. <laughs> and when it's once the soil in the water, when the, another problem is that so much as the stormwater running off is runs off into the waterways and carries soil and litter with it. It's also then not soaking into the ground and recharging our groundwater. It's not nourishing our plants and trees, and the lands are more likely to dry up. So um, 
And then that also needs to us leading to add more supplemental water to the soil to help our trees and plants grow. And I, I picked three different ones for us. And, and one of the big ones that we see is a problem with a huge problem with sedimentation. Um, I mean, if any, a lot of our streams, I mean, we've had, you know, so much runoff and, you know, it comes from, as uh, Sarah pointed out, but it, it comes from, um, you know, from housing. It also comes from farms. You know, we, we, we see, and we, we not only work, you know, our chapter not only covers the Lake Erie watershed, but it covers, uh, we go downstate into Crawford County as well. And you see a lot of issues with, uh, you know, especially when you look at some of the farms, uh, sedimentation there, where the animals are allowed to graze too close to the stream bank. Also runoff from fertilizer is a huge problem as how it affects our water. Uh, to take that back to the Lake Erie watershed, I mean, if, if you were there last summer, there were signs everywhere on Presque Isle saying that you can't let your dog go in the water and things like that. Uh, there, there's all kinds of, you know, issues with that. And then one that contributes to all these and drives a lot of these issues and some that I didn't mention is climate change. You know, a lot of things have changed. Um, I was on Facebook yesterday and a local guide had posted uh, you know, some pictures the last couple of days of some fish, you know, which is that's what guides do. And uh, he pointed out that over the, he posted those for a reason. And over the last several years, uh, the best fishing for steelhead has traditionally been in the spring. I mean, we get the runs in the fall, but the best fishing has been in the streams. And this past couple of years, the best fishing has been in December. So I know we had, you know, an unusual winter last year, but this was, you know, it's, it's not maybe a scientific study. It was only done over three years and it's one man's observations, but uh, it, things are changing. And I, I noticed it, uh, I have a camp in Warren County and I noticed that fishing season seems to be over, you know, in some of the streams that warm up by May, maybe early May, where we used to be able to, you know, regularly fish and, you know, safely return the fish in, even up until July. And so, I mean, I've noticed a lot of changes there as well. Thank you to all of you for those threats. And I, I know this is just a small snapshot of the threats that we all know uh, exist for to um, that affect clean water. So keeping those threats in mind, um, can each of you give us some solutions that your organization is specifically working toward? And I, for this one, we'll go ahead and start with Jim. Sure. Um, our chapter is involved in a lot of different things. Uh, we work on bag stabilization projects uh, as recently as, you know, last, last fall was the most recent one. Um, this coming Friday, there's a, a planning. We also, we partner with on some projects with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and they're doing the planning on uh, Elk Creek this Friday. Hope it doesn't rain too much for that. But that's just a, a finish up of the project they did by the railroad tubes there just off of Route 5. So we, we definitely do that. Um, and as I said, part of that riparian buffer plannings. And um, another thing that uh, several years ago, a few members of our chapter were trained by Trout Unlimited on how to do water testing. And over the last several years, and I guess, no, I could throw in COVID as an excuse. I don't know if it's a valid one, but we our chapter has basically gotten away from that. So a few weeks back, a few members from our chapter went down uh, with a one of our other local chapters, uh, Caldwell Creek chapter, they've been testing for many years um, and just went out and, and re, re, you know, relearned the process again and, and tried to pick up some best practices from them. Because like I said, they've been doing this for a long time. And some of the data they've collected led to finding of one of the companies for uh, polluting with, frack, with water from the fracking or from water sand chemicals from the fracking process. To be able to prove something like that in court, you have to have very, very stringent record keeping, and they are very good at that. So for us, it was a no-brainer to go and, you know, and try to learn a little bit, some of their best practices from them. Thanks, Jim. Sarah or Amber, do either of you have, some, have something additional to add to that, additional uh, solutions that you're working toward? Yeah, I, I can go. Um, so. 
I talked a lot about those best management practices and Jim mentioned best management practices as well. So uh, something that we're working towards is being the hands and the boots and the chest waiters that can come out and help push those best management practices forward. Uh, we're working to plant native shrubs and trees in riparian areas. Uh, we're, uh, we're working with conservation districts, uh, the watershed associations in our area, including Plua um, and the Lake Erie Arboretum at Frontier, and even conservancies like the WPC that Jim mentioned and French Creek Valley Conservancy. And all of these organizations bring about these wonderful opportunities to uh, find the right places for riparian buffers and um, bring the plants to plant in the riparian buffers, and then we can bring uh, the hands to do the work um, if the hands are available. Uh, so uh, we also have been working to establish three soon to be four live stake nurseries across the three counties that I coordinate. Uh, those were funded through DEP's Growing Greener grant, and live stake nurseries consist of native fast-growing shrubs that uh, will support future restoration efforts by taking cuttings from the shrubs and using them in erosion control projects. Um, so that's kind of what we're working towards, um, pushing those best management practices forward and um, trying to connect our volunteers to those efforts in the community. Sarah, I want to hear from you in just a minute, but I did want to interject just real quickly because we're talking a lot about riparian zones and plants and planting plants along uh, streams and waterways. And for the folks who are listening who maybe don't understand the connection between plants and, and water quality, I just wanted to clarify. So when we have plants um, like these native shrubs that are planted along waterways, it helps to prevent erosion, which keeps the sediment that Sarah Peelman talked about from getting into our streams. And that sediment is a type of pollution, even though it's natural, it keeps, it prevents wildlife from being able to breathe with their gills in the water, and then also makes the water dirtier for us to use as well. Um, and the other thing that plants do along waterways is they actually filter water and they slow it down. So we can, we have, uh, water enters our streams more slowly and it enters our streams cleaner than before, uh, than it would be without those plants. So just wanted to clarify that a little bit. You know, some folks might be thinking, why are plants so important um, to protecting water? And they're actually one of our best solutions. And then they have lots of other added benefits too with, you know, habitat, uh, providing habitats for wildlife and um, shading the creek as, creeks as well. So plants are our best friends. All right, Sarah, I'll let you go ahead. Thank you to Sarah for bringing those points to mind. Um, some of the work that Plua is doing is most recently we developed a stream monitoring program and, um, <clears throat> We work with Amber through her program with the Master Watershed Stewards. They also participate in that, where we test certain streams for um, some basic things like temperature, water clarity, conductivity, and nitrates. Um, it's mostly to note any significant changes in the stream. It's just to have eyes and ears out in the stream. We've also done like storm water stenciling um, projects where you um, storm water on the storm drains stencil on them like the body of water that that flows into so people realize the water's flowing into a body of water um there's the misconception that the storm drains along our streets sometimes flow to like wastewater treatment plants but they don't they flow directly into our local streams and then the bay and the lake um in the past clue has also done larger um, stream restoration projects and we help partner on projects like putting litter booms in the streams but mostly we bring people together to learn about their watershed and to help facilitate projects um, we bring together professors scientists grant writers professionals in their field together with common citizens people from the fishing community community and just people who love the water in general so that's our largest role i think is bringing people together to talk about watersheds and learn about them as expected everyone you can't talk about solutions without talking about collaboration and partnerships <laughs> we have thousands of miles of stream in erie county and the and the surrounding counties and a lot of our waterways are dependent on having boots on the ground who can really do some of the the critical work in the stream bank restoration riparian buffer uh, plantings and whatnot that were described. But I just want to ask, are there any other collaborative partnerships that you wanted to highlight, whether it be local, regional, statewide? Wanted to give you the opportunity to highlight any of those other partnerships. Amber, did you want to go first? 
Sure. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I talked a lot about our partners uh, that are conservation partners locally and how we are working with them to do a lot of plantings and riparian buffer management. Um, but another project that I'd love to highlight is a partnership that's more focused on plastic debris going into Lake Erie, which is a threat that I'm surprised we didn't talk about yet. Um, but plastic is one of the biggest issues that we are facing, along with all of the other issues that we've talked about. And the Master Watershed Steward Program teamed up with Penn State Barron, Gannon University, and the Erie County Conservation District to create the Erie Litter Critters. And um, I can drop the link to the website in the chat, but essentially the website that we developed together um, is a place to house the data that is being collected by litter booms in Erie County, uh, by street sweepers, by storm drains, um, and a place to display that data. And then there are also ways to get involved. So you can become a litter critter by volunteering to pick up trash. Um, and then the Erie County Conservation District has the background and the knowledge to help teach citizens how to prevent plastic pollution in the first place. So without all of those folks doing their part in these roles, we could not have created such a strong and valuable asset to the community. Thanks, Amber. I agree that somehow plastic pollution did not come up yet. So thank you. I, and I appreciate Jim making the connection to fossil fuels that he was talking about with partners in the Caldwell Creek watershed. Of course, we know that plastic is derived from fossil fuels. We, we have a lot of petrochemical infrastructure, as it's called, that converts natural gas in particular to plastics in Western Pennsylvania. So we're part of a, a large web of that system. But Jim or Sarah, did you want to highlight any other collaborations? Yeah, I, I can go next. Um, I became president of the chapter of Trout Unlimited in January. And one of the first things that I realized was that you can't, we just can't do everything alone. I mean, we would love to be able to, you know, solve pollution or world hunger or whatever. And we just can't do that. So it's as our, as by ourselves anyway. So for us, it's really important that we collaborate with you know, various uh, organizations here that are like-minded. And I've already mentioned the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, who I've had the pleasure to work with on several projects now. Um, we're also trying to get uh, more, part of what I want to see happen as, when I'm, as I'm president, and hopefully going forward from there, would be to make our, our organization a little more visible and available to some of the other organizations. And we've done that by uh, our past president and myself try to make it to uh, every PUA meeting that we can. I think we've done pretty good this year. Uh, I'd probably get a D from Jenny for dialing into the Penn Futures meetings, but I, I try to get on as often as I can just, just to keep up with everything. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. I don't, you know, I'm not able to do all of that, but um, I, I guess those are really the main things for me, trying to get more visible. I, I just had the feeling that our chapter in some ways, even though it's been around since the 60s, uh, just a little plug, we're the second oldest trout and limited chapter in Pennsylvania. But, um, you know, we've been flying under the radar for a lot of years. I mean, everybody hears about the Suns and the Pennsylvania Steelhead Organization Association and the 3CU that does a lot of the, you know, the nursery work and stuff like that, and, and deservedly so. But for us to be able to continue with our mission, we need, we need to partner with, you know, um, you know more like-minded organizations, as I said, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we would like to do more things with Asbury Woods as well. Thank you. Yeah, everybody's probably getting the idea. No one entity can really do it alone in this work um, because all the land is connected through water and everything happens on the land also happens in the water. Nothing happens in the watershed and isolation. As the saying goes, we all live downstream, right? So we all would benefit to care about the water. Um, I didn't mention it in my introduction, but I also work for the city of Erie as a sustainability coordinator. So one of the partners of PLUA um, for some of the larger projects that we have done is the city of Erie. Um, that's who we partnered with to do our a stream bank restoration project and some of the litter booms. But we also partner with local universities like Mercyhurst and Gannon and Penn State University, the Barron Campus. We also partner with Pennsylvania Sea Grant, the Lake Erie Region Conservancy, Sons Lake Erie, Trout Unlimited. Like the, the, there's lots of 
um, groups, as I said before, our goal is to really bring people together and even some of the authorities like the Port Authority, um, even Relief and LEAF, their efforts to plant trees in the watershed. Um, it, it's all about collaboration. It's who don't we work with, right? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Again, the theme here is we need many hands make light work. Like that is definitely part of part of uh, watershed advocacy and management. I did want to just give a bit of a time period to say, like, how do people get involved? Amber mentioned the website. Jim was talking about how they're a chapter part of a, a national organization. And I've had that opportunity to partner with Trout Unlimited at the state level. So I'm hoping that you all can give a little bit more context on what does it mean to volunteer for your group? How do you get involved? Where are the meetings, et cetera? Uh, Sarah, we'll start with you this time since you went last last time. Sure, thank you. Um, for PLUA, people can volunteer to um, be a watershed representative. And what that means is they would be an advocate for their um, watershed. They can choose a watershed that they live in or work in or just one that they enjoy recreation in. Um, doing that, you would be um, the eyes and ears for your watershed and <clears throat> try to walk it a couple of times a year and notice what's going on. Um, we have the stream teams too, where we have people helping to um, monitor different streams. We're hoping to expand that program into the future. And uh, PLUA has monthly meetings. They're always the first Tuesday of the month at, um, they're at 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. They're at 3.30 p.m. And we've been having them at the uh, LEAF Education Building in Frontier Park in the city of Erie. And um, folks are always welcome to come to those meetings or they can always reach out to me or Sister Pat or, you know, Amber, Jenny, Sarah, you're all on the Plume board as well. So really you can reach out to almost any of us. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. And I, I'm glad you highlighted the role of a watershed representative because a lot of those folks help with the water monitoring that Sarah mentioned, but they're also the eyes and ears on the ground for any concerns. They have residents that come to them if there are certain projects of concern that may impact water quality. So the, the watchdogging component of what PLUA does, I think, is a really uh, interesting part of their mission, too. Jim or Amber, did you want to add to that? I will. Um, I mean, for our chapter, one of the things you ask is how do you get involved? Uh, the easiest way is to become a, a chapter member. And that's with, with that, you the benefit of that membership is you get at least one monthly email from me and, you know, describing what the chapter is doing and uh, what's going, you know, and also future events. And uh, we also, as I said, we're trying to be a little more visible. We established uh, a Facebook page, probably a long time in coming. And the nice thing about that is uh, we can share, you know, information from National Trout Unlimited, from the state chapter, from local chapters, also from local organizations like the Suns, Steelhead Oaks, to let everyone know uh, what those organizations are up to as well as our own, and also events that are coming up that you can volunteer to help with. Uh, you know, all, all those organizations do various, you know, things throughout the year to get people involved. So we like to make people aware of that. So when they thing also about the Facebook page is that we get, as you can imagine from Facebook, we get a lot of curiosity, you know, people joining the joining the group. It's, it's an open group. We don't restrict it. Um, and so we we're able to get that message out to more people than I ever can, you know, with, with my newsletter that I send out. So uh, that that's probably, you know, the easiest way for us in our meetings. You ask where they're held. We only, we usually have five for general membership meetings, there are only four that we do during the course of the year. Uh, we're kind of on hiatus now. We did have one in April and we won't uh, reconvene until September, but um, you know, we, we do try to keep in touch. We have a fishing outing coming up at Oil Creek just to try to get some of the chapter members together. And, and it, it's just strange in a way, I guess, because you hold an event like that and you get some of the chapter members that you never see at the meetings ever. And so that that just tells me that we need to, you know, as I said a couple of times, I'm kind of uh, beating this into the ground, but we just need to be more visible and get out there and interact with people and, you know, make them aware of uh, volunteer opportunities. They may not want to go to meetings. That may not be their thing. I know there's a lot of, um, you know, younger people that 
going to a meeting and listening to a speaker may be good occasionally, but that's not really what they want to do all the time. They want more from an organization than that. And therefore we need to change, you know, with the times a little bit. So those are the things we're working to do. And I'll just add a little bit about how to get involved with the Master Watershed Stewards. Uh, but before I do, the reason I was kind of laughing, Jim, is because that's so true. Like I, we have monthly meetings every fourth Tuesday of the month in the evening and they're on Zoom. And I typically will get about 10 to 15 Master Watershed Stewards out of the 40 that we have across all three counties. But when it comes to signing up for events, that's what they want to do. They want to plant the trees. They want to test the water. Um, so I was kind of, you know, laughing at that aspect. So maybe we can join forces a little bit and talk about better strategies. Um, but to get involved with our program, uh, you can go to Penn State Extension's website and look up Master Watershed Stewards. Uh, but locally, you can just email me. We do a training every spring. Um, we're about halfway through our current spring training, but we do one every year. And that training involves about 40 hours of coursework and some in-class or in-person um, uh, learning where you do hands-on work, like learning how to test water and how to plant trees and things like that. Um, and then every uh, year, the stewards commit 20 hours of service towards the program to stay involved. Um, so that's that's how you can get involved um, with us. Um, I send quite a few emails out, um, definitely more than once a month, but probably once or twice a week, but uh, it just depends on the year. Uh, spring season's really, really busy, as I think we all here understand. Um, so the more opportunities, though, the better. Um, there's a diverse uh, array of options for people that want to get involved. It's not all about planting trees. If you have an education background and you want to teach people, then you can teach people about water. Um, if you have a graphic design background, you can get involved and help us work on some of our social media content. Um, so if anyone wants to get involved in any way, uh, definitely send me an email. All right, thanks. Hopefully we see more people flooding in for all of the organizations. Um, along those lines, I want us to think, have some wishful thinking here. I think some of the best ideas can come from pie in the sky thinking. So think about if capacity and resources were no longer considerations for you. What strategies do you think or that do you wish could be utilized in the Erie region to protect clean water, clean up clean water, um, and for this one, let's start with Sarah Peelman again. Thanks, Sarah. Um, this is my favorite question because the biggest thing that I always want to do is daylight the Mill Creek tube. <laughs> that would be awesome. It was an engineering feat of its time. It's our largest storm part of our stormwater system, but um, the streams would be so much healthier if we could daylight that tube, but obviously it would take a lot of uh, money and resources to be able to do that. Besides that, um, it would be awesome if we also could just buy up land that were, were wetlands, especially wetlands in the um, urban areas and riparian buffer properties along our local streams and bluffs to uh, preserve them as green space or to develop them as parks, especially in the upper water sheds or the headwaters of the watersheds. Um, yeah, that would be really awesome if we could start doing stuff like that. <laughs> okay, how about Amber for this one, the second one? Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, it's hard to think about if capacity and resources were not a barrier, um, but my thought on this is that I guess my wish list, my wish item would be that there was a some kind of incentive for Erie County community members to put in practice the best management practices for watershed health on their property. Um, so if, if they had a monetary incentive or there was some kind of roadmap laid out for them as to how to do it and they were capable of doing it without taking their own finances into, into factor, then it would be a really great uh, way for the Erie community to develop best management practices on all properties in Erie um, when they're considering, you know, changing uh, the way that a stream moves or when they are uh, building a new building or doing new infrastructure. Um, I guess I just wish the funding was there to uh, make those barriers break down. 
Kim, do you have anything to add? I, I would add that, and it's really just adding on to what uh, others have said, but funding is always a problem. And one thing that I've seen as a member of Trout Unlimited is, I, I wish, I guess my wish would be if I could, you know, had money wasn't an object and you could do whatever you wanted, would be that there would be a steady flow of that type of money. And it, it wouldn't change with the political climate or things like that. I mean, the last few years, there haven't been a lot of stream improvement projects because the money just wasn't, wasn't there to do them. And uh, if, 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 if our government, you know, to not get too, you know, pie in the sky here, but if, if the government would just establish a policy that would continue from administration to administration so that we could actually make progress, because we need to do that with uh, the global warming and such. I mean, when, when I, I'm on streams a lot and I see a lot of damage, you know, and then that water's not, I don't know, we've already gone through all that, but that would be the, that would be the thing. I think that's going to continue. I think this, unfortunately, this type of damage is not just a, a you know, a fluke or a recent occurrence. I'm afraid that as time goes on, it's going to become more prevalent. And therefore, you know, to have a steady funding policy to be able to, you know, continually work on those projects. I mean, we're way behind now, but when the funding dries up, then we, the, the rains don't stop and such, and, and we, we just, we never catch up. Maybe we never will, but we could at least continue on and have, you know, we, they could, we could have plans, five-year, 10-year plans. And right now it's so tough for organizations to do that. Thank you all for, for, for speaking to those. I, I'm gonna put in a plug for what Jim was just talking about as an advocate and somebody who lobbies elected officials for clean water funding fairly often. That, that was such an important part of the conversation and thank you. The next question, and Amber started to get into this with what folks can do on their on their properties, but I'm interested in some examples other than joining your organizations and being part of the great work that you're doing. What are some other things that Erie County residents can do to improve water quality locally on their properties and in their everyday lives? I'm going to go first just because I want to put a plug in that voting is one of the best things you can do to protect clean water. And the deadline to register to vote in the May 16th primary is May 1st. So everybody check your registration status. It's so important that we elevate clean water issues in politics and with our elected officials. So with that, I'll let the others go. I'll, I'll start with Jim on this one. For me, it would be, I, I just put, reduce the use of pesticides. That's a huge problem. Uh, lawn fertilizers is another problem because as Sarah said, that runs right into the lake. If it goes into the storm water, there's no filtering of that whatsoever. And I've already mentioned some of the problems we've seen around, especially in the Western basin of Lake Erie, but in our neck of the lake, if you will, the problems that we've you know, begun to encounter as they've moved this way. And, and just generally water consumption in general, you know, we're, we're, you see a lot of it in the West where the water you know, is, is a problem more so than here because we have this you know wonderful great lake out there but all that water still has to be pumped in filtered and processed and we waste a lot of that on unnecessary watering and things like that and and i think you know and it's all it's all it all it all works together i mean if if you use native plants that are you know have been here historically for thousands of years or more uh, they may require less water they're more hardy to you know, some of the, the situations that we see here. So it's, it's, it's basically those things, just to protect what we're, we're, our water that we have because it's such a valuable resource and to not pollute it by doing things. You know, we don't have to have the, the greenest lawn in the neighborhood and, uh, you know, the pesticides to kill, kill all the bugs and things like that is not necessary. It's not, it's not a good thing. And I, I would love to see that, you know, some of those practices uh, at least reduced, if not stopped altogether. I want to just quickly chime in and follow up on what Jim mentioned as far as conserving the water that we have. All of the water that we have is the only water we're ever going to have, right? So we have to take care of the water resources that we have now because we're not getting new fresh water. Um, so that's something that I think people need to keep in mind is as you're watering your lawn or, or just letting the water run, you're, you're wasting a resource that we're not getting more of. Thanks, those are great examples. And Jim, thanks for also mentioning lawn care, best management practices. Now that we're in spring and I have neighbors who seemingly mow every 
36 hours, <laughs> it's, it's a good reminder of some of the things we can do for water friendly lawn care management. Amber, did you want to go next on this one? Sure. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I, I was going to talk a lot about what Jim said, actually, but I'll add on to that. Um, I think one of the best things that Erie community members can do to improve water quality locally is to just change the way that you're thinking about how you're managing your property. Um, if, you're, if you have a stream or a pond in your backyard, maybe leave a gap of 50 feet around that pond so that it has a good riparian buffer. Um, you can find tons and tons of research resources out there to help you uh, learn how to do these things. Um, it's, it's free information and it typically costs you less money to care for your property in a watershed friendly way than it does if you're using pesticides and herbicides and if you're mowing every 36 hours. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, residents and community members can consider just picking up trash, making sure trash gets to where it's supposed to be. You know, think about the, the recycling ordinances in your municipality and uh, what can and cannot be recycled. Um, host a local cleanup or participate in a cleanup and see how it makes you feel. Um, it can be really um, like tranquil to walk along your property and just remove any tiny piece of trash that you find. Um, you're benefiting your property, but you're also benefiting the watershed. Sarah Peelman, go ahead. You always have tons of ideas here. <laughs> well, I agree. A lot of really great things have already been mentioned, um, but some of the things we can add is not to dump anything down the drain that you wouldn't want to drink yourself, um, whether that's your house drains or the storm drains along the streets. Like I said before, they empty straight into our local streams and creeks and flow into the Presque Isle Bay and Lake Erie. And like Jim said, I mean, even just using less water. I mean, it's a message that's in, been around for a long time, but, you know, turn off the water when you wash your dishes by hand, when you're brushing your teeth, even in the shower. Um, and I think this was probably mentioned as well earlier, but to help stop the spread of invasive species, whether they're on the land or in the water, um, try to remove them from your local streams and wetlands whenever possible and using the least toxic meth methods like Jim and Amber both mentioned, plant native trees and plants everywhere. <laughs> That's another one of the best things we could just do. And Sarah, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but Sarah's also the city arborist. So she <laughs> is very closely connected to making sure that we have native trees in particular in the city of Erie. So we're thankful for her wearing that hat locally too. Thank you, Jenny. So that brings us to, we've got about 12 minutes to go. And I know that we had a question on the Facebook live feed. Folks, please do feel free to use the Q&A feature for additional questions that you may have if you're on Zoom. And I just had it up. It was Art Leopold who asked the question, so thank you, Art. Art asks, we recently heard that Erie is the fifth fastest warming city in America. What does that awareness change about the way we look at Lake Erie now and in the future? What mitigation or action is now necess more necessary now than ever? Well, again, I think we can say that we need to plant more trees. <clears throat> trees, um, you know, help reduce ur urban heat islands and they, um, you know, help cool our cities. They cool our streets. They help cool our homes. Um, but it is kind of a big deal to think about for folks. I mean, it's something we don't always think about, especially in Pennsylvania. I mean, we're named after having woods. Penn's Woods is the name of our state. So we kind of take it for granted that we always have trees everywhere we go, but especially in urban areas, that is not true. And um, we do need more trees. There's a lot of cement, a lot of pavement, a lot of buildings, a lot of parking lots. So we do need to keep that in mind. And planting trees doesn't just clean the water, but it also helps cool the air. Others want to weigh in too. I know this is a multi-part question, so. I can weigh in. Um, I think along with what Sarah said, planting more trees and more native species, but also I'm talking a lot about best management practices, but it is the best way to have a forward thinking planning method. 
So if you're planning to do something, if you're planning to create a new structure, um, if you're planning to uh, plant an area, uh, just try to look into the best management practices that exist. Um, those practices exist today in hopes that they are setting up tomorrow for the best possible outcome. Uh, so anytime that we are planning new things, new construction, even renovations, we should always be considering what we can do to uh, take the watershed health into consideration. And a lot of that comes back to um, using those best management practices that are set by conservation authorities. Amber, that's a great example. Consult experts and rely on local folks that have that expertise is, is a great example. Jim, were you going to go? I'm sorry. Sure. I'll, I'll wait my turn. No problem. I, I would just say that our schools are very important in that because, you know, the, the, it's their future. And um, <clears throat> one of the things, and I didn't mention this earlier, and I'm not just trying to do a shameless plug for Travel Unlimited, but one of the programs that we do have is Travel in the Classroom. And as part of that, some of the schools have invited us to go in and talk to the, the children about the aquatic life. You know, it, it's, it's, yes, it's centered around fishing, but, you know, the, the, you know, the bugs live in the water. They need clean water. And, and that is correct curriculum. And I'm not really sure. I don't have any kids at that age now that are going to school, but it has to start there. Our science, you know, that's the STEM, you know, and the yes part of that, the science part of it to make sure that that's being taught in all the schools. And if it isn't, it really needs to be because it's, it's just really that, you know, it's really that important. You know, I think everyone, as everyone was talking about, there were a couple of questions. One of the things I was thinking was everybody needs to have a well instead of just a, a you know, a constant flow of water to feel, you know, to learn how that is. And, and I mentioned earlier, I had a camp and I, I've, I've done a lot of things to try to mitigate water use because I have to. Not only do I have a well, but I have a, a septic system as well that I also have to protect. So when, when, when you begin to look at it from that standpoint, I, I think it's even more important to get the, you know, the words out to the, to the kids, to, to their school, and get them involved in more things like trout in the classroom or going to places like Asbury Woods where they can get out and see how, how, how the real world actually works. Unfortunately, you know, um, a lot of us spend a lot more time on video games than we do walking in the woods. I, I really, uh, I really think the education part of that is key. All right, we have another question here in the chat, the Q and A um, from Issy Lori. Um, plastic in our waterways and our and water bodies really concerns me. What can we do about this? So, how can we reduce the plastic in our waterways? And also, you know, we're starting to see it pop up in us and other living things. Um, what are some solutions to the plastic issue? I'll jump in if that's okay, since I talked about it. Um, I just want to start by quoting Dr. Sam Mason at Penn State Barron. The best way to prevent and uh, to, to solve this plastic problem is to turn off the tap. So turning off the tap of the plastic that we are already using, um, using less plastic so that we it doesn't make its way into the environment. Um, not a lot of the plastic that we actually use every day gets recycled. So it ultimately ends up in a landfill somewhere or in our watershed. So um, definitely uh, turning off that tap and trying to prevent the, your buying of plastic or using of plastic in any way possible is a great way to start. Yeah, that's a great answer, Amber. It's a really big issue. <clears throat> And um, big issues often seem overwhelming to people, so it's hard to think of answers to stuff like that. But it, but it's small steps that we can take, like Amber was saying, you know, re reduce the amount of plastic that you're using. And also, I think Amber is the one who mentioned it earlier, is to go out and pick up garbage, like pick up litter, pick it when pick it up when you see it, and to not litter anymore. <laughs> but I mean, those are two simple things, but there's still things that the everyday person could do every day. Maybe a little bit would be to look at the past a little bit, uh, showing my age here a bit. When I was a kid, milk came in bottles, glass bottles that, uh, you know, you put in your little milk box and they were, when you were done with them, and they went back and were refilled 
you know, reuse of containers and things like that, which we've really gotten so far away from. And, you know, it's exactly what Sarah said, you know, use less plastic, obviously, but to maybe go back to those types of things where, you know, we, we never had this plastic problem before. Plastic, unfortunately, it's curses, it's too convenient and too easy to use. So I know, I know that at Prescal, they're looking to do things to reduce like plastic straws or things like that. But, you know, that, that has to, that has to happen, you know, really everywhere for us to be able to do that. And again, get back to more, more types of containers that we can reuse again, I think is very important. I just want to add, I recently traveled out of the country and um, everywhere, so I flew out of Canada and went to Ireland and in both countries, everywhere I went, they had cardboard straws, everywhere. So it's definitely, it's not as hard, as difficult as we've made it. Um, there are, there are replacements. Um, and that's still, you know, that's still a convenience item, certainly. Um, and we want to get away from convenience items as much as possible, regardless of what they're made of. But there are steps to, to um, fix these solutions, fix these issues. Jenny, you want me to read the next question in the, in the Q&A? Okay. Um, so Aaron Kerr from Groundwork Erie, which is in its fifth month of operations, so brand new, welcome Aaron and Groundwork Erie uh, to the landscape. How can Groundwork Erie help to develop a comprehensive climate resilience plan for the city of Erie and um, that would also affect the watershed? Great question. And how it's perfect timing because the city of Erie right now is trying to develop a local climate action plan working through a program um, with the DEP and uh, Penn State University and some of their students. So Aaron, um, I would love to uh, contact you or you can contact me to um, get involved in that process. We're also hoping at the city of Erie right now, um, we're asking folks who are interested in applying to be on our new environmental advisory council. Um, and we're hoping those folks will also pick up some of the work to finish developing the local climate action plan. We um, just are in the initial phases of it, did some baseline data gathering, and um, we definitely need to keep that moving. So that would be wonderful if Groundwork Erie would like to be involved in um, that process. Our next step is to take it out into the community and get feedback from our local neighborhoods and local citizens. And um, we developed a survey to take to the community to gather some information to bring back. And so we definitely could use help with that. And um, yeah, there's lots of things we can work towards. So that's great that you're interested in that and are willing to help. Thank you, Erin. And my understanding of Groundwork Erie is that they're gonna be another organization that's gonna be kind of boots on the ground or waiters in the stream as Amber put it. So that'll be great to see. And Raven, I think unless we have more questions, maybe from Facebook, I think we're ready to wrap up. I'll, I will real quick before I, I know I passed it over to Raven a little too quickly. I wanna just say thank you to our panelists for joining us. And you know, hopefully the folks who are watching or folks who watch the, the recording of this realize how important it is to protect our water resources, how important they are, especially to a city and a region on, on a great lake, one of the largest lakes in the world. And, um, you know, we're all working really hard, but could use your help to protect these important resources. Jenny, do you have anything else to say before we wrap up? I think that was the perfect way to sum it up. Get involved, reach out to the folks that have been panelists today. They're doing really fantastic work. And also thank you to the panelists, everyone for participating, and also the Jefferson for making it possible to do, to do a virtual event this afternoon. And join everybody's email list. Definitely do that. Um, I left some of the links in the chat so everybody can see that. Um, and then I also believe that I can send out an email with um, everybody's newsletter links to it, to all the participants. So I just want to thank our panelists and our moderators for educating us about Erie's water quality today. Um, and I would also like to thank our audience for participating in this important discussion. Um, for more information on the JES, please visit our website, www.jeserie.org, and follow us on social media. This has been Raven Clark with the Jefferson Educational Society, and thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.